Welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. We have so many reasons to come together to sing and to praise the Lord. And one of our songs today is called 10,000 Reasons That We Bless the Lord. And there are countless blessings of how God has answered our prayers, worked on our life, and changed us. And I love it how the psalmist says in Psalm 103, verses 19 through 22, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength you perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you who serve him, doing his will. Bless the Lord, all you works of his, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And so all of creation is pointing heavenward towards God and acknowledging that he is sovereign. He is the ruler on high. He is the one that deserves all blessings and all glory and all honor. And so I would add to us, bless the Lord Fellowship Bible Church as we come together in song and worship, as we hear God's word. And this idea that we're the recipient of God's blessings and yet we can bless him. It's not that we have anything to give God, when we are talking about blessing the Lord with all that we are, our heart, our mind, our soul, our strength, it means to express our humble adoration of who God is and for what he's done. It means to speak well of him, to, to praise him for everything that he is and all the ways that he's changed us. It means that the posture, not just physically of who we are, but our heart is oriented towards the Lord and bowing towards him in submission. And so as we reflect on these many reasons that we have to be grateful, may we respond with great praise and great blessing because of the one who has blessed us. Let's open the time in prayer and worship together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have provided grace upon grace. We are truly overwhelmed by your great work in our life. And so, Father, may we respond with worship and with blessing toward you. You've already given us so much. And so this morning, may we come before you, bowing before your throne, acknowledging that you are the God on high. We know that we're sinners who need to be forgiven. We need a savior. And so that's why we thank you for Jesus, who is willing to pay that sacrifice on the cross on our behalf. And so as we lift up our, our songs to you today, may it go forth. May we continue to carry the gospel with us wherever we are, ready to share the story and the testimony of how you changed us. Thank you so much for this time of worship. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh, 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 my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh, my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find bless the lord oh my soul 
bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh, oh, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. On that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. I'll worship your holy name. I'll worship your holy name. I will declare my joys to the nations. I will shout for joy in the congregation. I will worship God. Almighty, oh, those who love the Lord are satisfied. Those who trust in Him are justified. I will serve my God. Oh, my days, the word of the Lord will stand, but his love will endure. The joy of the Lord is strength to my soul. I will not be shaken. I will not be moved. I will not be shaken. Would you please stand and join us? I will declare my joys to the nations. I will shout for joy in the congregation. I will worship God. Worship God. All my days, those who love the Lord are satisfied. Those who trust in Him are justified. I will serve my God. Serve my God. All my days. And the nations The word of the Lord will stand. Their eyes and fall. But his love will endure. The joy of the Lord is strength to my soul. I will not be shaken. I will not be moved. I will not be shaken. 
Amen. The Bible describes Jesus as our cornerstone, which in building or architecture terms is the foundation and the centerpiece for which all the other plans that a building is, is based upon. And as we are so gracious and, and blessed to have moved into our new church and our sanctuary and the sanctuary remodel to come, we think, though, that this church is not built upon the brick or the mortar, but it's built upon the foundation of Christ. And that foundation is so solid and so firm that we know that no matter what comes our way in life, no matter what trials or tribulations, we'll never be shaken or moved. We can never be snatched from the Father's hand because he is all-knowing, all-powerful, and ever-present. And so as we should suffer and sometimes go through these moments of, of hopelessness where it feels like we're just lost in this dark tunnel. We're reminded, though, that there's hope, that there's light, that those things don't last forever. Eventually, these things will pass. And we have a, a God that brings us through these hard times, who's comforting us, who provides us perfect peace. And so that when we emerge on the other side intact and whole and restored, we might be able to tell of the great works that God has done in our life. And so each of us, we have a testimony of how Christ has changed us, has turned us away from the old ways, made us new creations so that we could live a life full of hope and meaning. And so our next song, which talks about my story, it's really God's story of how he used us and changed us to be a part of his sovereign plan. And so let's, let's pray, oh, let's, let's sing together as we sing about God's story. If I told you my story, you would hear hope and wouldn't let go. And if I told you my story, you would hear that I never gave up. If I told you my story, you would hear that it wasn't mine if I should speak and let it be of the grace that is greater than all my vice of injustice was served. And when mercy he went of the kindness of Jesus that draws me in, oh, to tell you my story is to tell the him. If I told you my story, you would hear victory over the enemy. If I told you my story, you would hear freedom that was won for me. If I told you my story, you would hear that overcome the grave. If I should speak, then let it be of the grace that is greater than all my, my sin. Of when justice was served. And when mercy wins of the kindness of Jesus that draws me in, 
Oh, to tell you my story is to tell the hill. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. For the grace that is greater than all my sin, of injustice what was served, and when mercy went, of the kindness of Jesus that draws me in. Oh, to tell you my story is to tell of the grace that is greater than all my, my sin. Of when justice was served and when mercy went. Of the kindness of Jesus that draws me in. Oh, to tell you my story is to tell of him. Oh, to tell you my story is to tell of him. This is our story. This is our song, praising our Savior all the day long. Amen. May I'll be seated. Pastor Steve. Anybody ever have this toy? Who had this toy? Oh, okay. Just me. And my brother. It's called a monster magnet. And so we used to go like this, and we would, you know, and we, we had two magnets. Th these magnets were so strong, it could make a toddler tug of war seem effective. And so, uh, uh, so these, these were fun. But also, if you flipped it around, you could push the other monster magnet because of the reverse polarity. Like the gospel. A magnet is attractive, and it is also repelling. And these are the realities that we need to understand about the gospel, as a magnet can both be attractive and repelling. It's the same with uh, the same of what we are understanding today. There's a magnetic force. I used to think that as a as a kid. Maybe magnets were the cure for gasoline and, and our transportation crisis, right? I mean, I, I used to use these reverse polarity and just push cars around. And, and I said, well, wouldn't that be neat? We had like magnets and then we had the reverse underneath the car. And then every once in a while, there'd be pulses of, uh, of reverse polarity or, or trains that can run. And, and it's already been thought of and, <laughs> and invented already. So I'm not a billionaire. But, but, uh, but you know, it, it's, it's neat when you start exploring the possibilities of these forces that attract and repel, and particularly when it comes to the gospel. There are hot button issues that if we talk about today, they are polarizing. There's like no middle ground. You talk about abortion, there's no middle ground view. I mean, you are either anti-abortion or you are, uh, or, or, or pro-abortion, or gender, sexuality, marriage, justice, politics. And yet all these issues have been settled in Genesis 1 through 9, when he made man in his image. We know life is sacred. When he made male and female, and when he brought marriage together as a union between a man and a wife. Those are all Genesis 1 and 2. Justice, Genesis 4. Government, Genesis 9. And so here we see 
uh, we see these institutions of God, which are now challenged today because the world today is looking through the lens of man and not the lens of God because the lens of God is controversial. We live in a world today that doesn't want to be told how to think or what to think, particularly from a divine perspective. And so these issues are either attractive or repelling. I know this kind of looks freaky. It's supposed to be a monster. So just look it up. I think it's a Mattel monster magnet, you know? And if you tell me like this is a thousand dollar toy, then, you know, I'll put it up on eBay later. But some suggestions when it comes to these issues and when we talk about them as Christians, don't scold. Let's not be the, the folks that go around saying, I, you know, I told you so, you know, or you should have listened to God. And, and then we, we look down on people in a, in a self-righteousness. Don't scold. Also, don't gloat. Right? If things might go our way politically or things don't go our way politically, we, we should not be gloating like, you know, when you see those NBA players stand over somebody or an NFL player stand over somebody and, you know, look down at them or spit on them. Right? Don't gloat. Teach truth. Be compassionate. Know that there's a human story besides these things. I was talking with the fellow who was trying to figure out a doctrinal statement, a, a shift in a doctrinal statement. And I told him the story behind the words. It's so easy just to look at the words and then just make judgments on it, but, but find the story. What, what was going on to motivate such a switch or a transition or a change? That we, we need to approach this with compassion and then focus on the gospel because the gospel solves the problems that were created in Genesis 1 through 9 and the problem of man's sin. And the, the, the answer is not government legislation or human religion or righteousness. It's the gospel of Christ that, that saves us from what we couldn't do in Adam, what we couldn't do in the flesh, what we can't do in our humanity. God saved us from. And so we need to focus on the gospel. And yet the gospel is so polarizing. A fellow by the name of Bell wrote in 71 in Christianity Today, he said, royalty to Jesus Christ entails a polarization from which no true believer can escape. All the world is polarized through loyalty to either good or evil. There are two who lay claim to the souls of men, God and Satan. Every man has a captain of his soul, Christ or Satan. There's going to be a great polarity. Even Jesus said, hey, I didn't come to make everything just so honky-dory, easy-peasy. He said, I didn't come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against his mother, a daughter-in-law against his mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves his father and mother more than uh, me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So he's already warning the apostles as he's commissioning them in Matthew 10. This is going to be polarizing. The gospel will attract, the, drop, the gospel will repel. And you need to be ready for both. So I'm going to share with you from Acts chapter 5 today, eight reasons why the gospel is polarizing. Eight reasons why the gospel is polarizing. Number one, the gospel evokes extremely polarizing responses. You preach the gospel, people convert. And when people convert, there's a response. What's happening to them? What's going on? Now, Remember, this is after Barnabas. This is after Ananias and Sapphira. The purification of the church led to a great demonstration in a powerful church. There were many signs and wonders that were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. The signs and wonders were to confirm the works of the apostles. The early message before the scriptures were complete. How do we know this is from God? Signs and wonders accompanied what was done with the apostles. Why are not signs and wonders normalized 
today. God still does miracles, but it's not a normal thing to just go around performing signs and wonders because there's no more apostles. This accompanied the apostles. So here they're all together in Solomon's portico where Peter preached his second message in Acts. And look at this. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of men and women. So here we're seeing, uh, who are these people that none of the rest dared to join them? Were they timid believers? They were probably the unbelievers who didn't want to join the church, but they had enough respect for the apostles because they were empowered by God. But here's, here's the first polarization response here. There are people who are added to the church by the thousands. It's amazing when you track the growth of the church in the first five centuries. The church just grew tremendously. Then the church did not grow for the next thousand years, from 500 to 1500. And during what we call the dark ages, when the church became more important than the gospel. And so actually the, the size of the church at 500 is the same size of the church around 1500, except more of the believers moved west in those thousand years. And then it wasn't until after the Reformation that there was a, a great draw to the message of the gospel again. And that spurred missionary zeal in the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th century, where we see a great missionary age again and seeing the church grow. But people are added. And when people are added, there are also people who say, I want nothing to do with this. I want nothing to do with this. The gospel evoked extremely polarizing responses. Secondly, oh, well, let me finish that out. So that even when they carried out the sick into the streets and they laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. So here is people saying, oh, this is so amazing what the apostles are doing. If we can even catch a glimpse of Peter's shadow, we're not talking about Peter Pan's rebellious shadow. We are talking about the apostle Peter's shadow. They said, oh, if even we can catch a glimpse of his shadow or touch the hem of Jesus's uh, robe, maybe I'll be healed. Was that superstitious? Perhaps. But, it, but, but look at the amazing effect. The people gathered from the towns and around Jerusalem bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. They were all healed. Healing was indiscriminate. It didn't matter what disease or what affliction they had. They were all healed. It is totally successful, right? And so here it was complete, not like some services where only some people might be healed if they had enough faith. It was just Jesus healed them all. And so there was this great excitement that came where the gospel was so attractive. But we also next see the repelling aspect of the gospel, where the gospel makes people jealous. The gospel makes people jealous. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with them, that is the party of the Sadducees, they were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles, and they put them in public prison. So the 12 apostles get arrested. And so they're put in prison because they were told not to preach the gospel, not to tell about Jesus who died on the cross for our sins, was buried and was resurrected on the third day. The authority of the Sadducees were at risk. And so they were jealous because these people would obey Christ rather than the Sadducees or the Sanhedrin, the ruling party of the Jewish people. So they were jealous of the power of this new Christianity that was healing people. Then they were also jealous of the popularity as thousands were being converted from Judaism to Christianity. So they were jealous of power. They were jealous of popularity. The gospel brings jealousy. I remember when I got saved as a high schooler, and then a few months later, my brother came to Christ as a junior higher. And then my mom, who, uh, who started go going back to church with us. So the three of us, we'd go to church, and then we would come back to a dad who was jealous of Christ. 
And his anger and his jealousy, he would drink. And we would come back almost every Sunday to a drunken dad. Because he hated the fact that we would go to church. And though we invited him, he, he didn't want to come. He was mad at God. When he finally got right with God, he saw how the gospel was a great unifier of family. But there were those days. We know the jealousy towards the gospel. You might have family members who do not understand why you want to be so committed to Christ, why you want to serve him, why you would give up making millions of dollars to take care of people in an unthankful job. You might have friends who are jealous of the gospel because you're committed to a Friday night youth group instead of going out partying and hanging and you know vaping with them on a Friday night. There's a jealousy that people will have because of the power and the popularity of the gospel. That's the second reason why the gospel is polarizing. A third reason why the gospel is polarizing is that the gospel is uniquely the message for salvation. And this upsets a lot of people because there's a lot of religions in the world. There's a lot of good people in the world. And, there's, and we're saying, what? There's only one name under heaven by, by which man can be saved, the name Jesus Christ? You mean Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life? You're so narrow-minded. But then we ask, how can there be one God or three gods or 30 million gods or no gods, and then you accept all religions as the same? There's got to be a truth out there. And our passion is not to just insult everybody, but our passion is for people to know the truth about who God is and who Jesus Christ is. When we have the words of life, people don't want to hear it. And during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors, and they brought them out and said, go and stand at the temple and speak to all the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak, and they began to teach. And so here at daybreak, they started to teach the gospel at 6 a.m. in the morning, when the doors at the temple opened, when dawn was breaking. They started preaching the gospel. The angel who instructed them caused these apostles to disobey the Sanhedrin so that they can obey the messenger of God. And they preached. The, notice it says, all the words of this life. The definite article, the, is very profound here. It's not just more religion, and it's just not more uh, moral stuff. It is the word of life, of eternal life, where Peter said in John 6, he said, Lord, you have the words of eternal life, of the new life in Christ, or as of salvation's blessings. We have the truth about life to be told, and the world doesn't want to hear it because they think they got all the self-help books that are telling them how to improve their life without God, instead of uh, all, which, which are okay because they're Band-Aids, but they don't change us from the inside when the root of our problem is sin and our rebellion before God. And he changes us from the inside because of his love. He comes in with the gospel and he forgives our sin. He removes his, our sin, puts it on Christ, and Christ takes his righteousness and puts it in us. So there's this internal transformation instead of the external self-help that we get from the books today. The gospel is uniquely the message for salvation, and those with other messages are going to repel against the hope of the gospel. You mean it's free? Oh, it can't be free. You only get what you pay for, not when you can't pay for your sins. The fourth reason why the gospel is polarizing is that it could be deemed illegal. Right now, it is not illegal to have freedom of religion. But in some other countries, it is illegal. All right, we call those countries creative access countries in missions jargon because missionaries can't be called missionary. They have to go in under creative access ways, such as what we call business as mission. So they'll, they'll take a business, they'll go in there with a creative business, and they'll hire people 
to even unsaved people to work in the business, but their lives and their message of the gospel and an underground church will, will help lead people to Christ. It could, the, the gospel could be deemed illegal. It may happen in this country, but it's happened in, in several countries that you now know of in what we call creative access countries. Here's what happened. And the guards were standing at the door. And when they opened them, there was nobody inside. So this is the door of the prison. They open up the prison and the, they're gone. To their surprise, the angel supernaturally released the 12 apostles. There was nobody inside. And so when the high priest came and those who were with them, they called together the council. This is the, all the group leaders, the Senate, which represents the Sanhedrin, who were the 70 rulers of uh, the Jewish party. Uh, and... Uh, and the prison guards, the captain of Israel, and they sent to the prison and have them brought. So bring them to us. And when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported, we found the prison securely locked. And so when the captain of the temple, and they, these were the temple guards who were, who were Jewish, but they were given authority by the Roman authorities to be the police of the temple, and the chief priests heard the words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And some came and told them, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and are teaching the people. I mean, they've been here since 6 a.m. Then the captain and the officers went and they brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest questioned them saying, we strictly charge you not to teach in this name. And yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. We told you not to preach the gospel. Why are you doing it? Remember in Acts chapter four, when they told Peter and John, do not preach the gospel. Whether uh, they charged them to not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But when Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. We're witnesses. The word witness in the Greek is the word martyru martyruo. We get our word martyr from that word. To be a witness is to be a martyr. We need to expect that there will be a price in preaching the gospel, even when it is against the law. The fifth reason why the gospel is polarizing is that the gospel is greater than the laws that silence it. The gospel is greater than the laws that silence it. Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. And then he talks about the aspects of the gospel, the resurrection, the father of our fathers, or the God of our fathers raised Jesus, the crucifixion, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. You guys are guilty. You Sanhedrin, you're guilty of of putting Jesus on the cross. We're all guilty of putting Jesus on the cross. Jesus went there for me, and he went there for them. He went to die on our behalf. But he was re resurrected. He was crucified. Verse 31, God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior. So here we have the ascension. So we have the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the ascendant, ascension of Christ to the right hand of authority as leader and savior. Notice it says to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. I was talking to somebody this week about uh, kind of a, a movement that is trying to do away with the, the whole concept of repentance when it comes, you just believe you don't have to repent. And as I was discussing this, this new trend, old trend, uh, we were, it's, the, the, the Bible teaches repentance. It's not that you have to quit smoking in order to be saved or you have to quit this habit in order to be saved, but you need to turn from sin in order to turn to Christ. You need to turn from sin in order to turn, turn towards righteousness. There needs to be an understanding that Christ went to the cross to pay for the judgment of our sins. He says here to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Repentance and forgiveness are hand in hand. Repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, and for God has given to those who obey him. So here, the key phrase, which champions the biblical concept of what we call civil disobedience. Now, please understand, the Bible teaches that we need to obey our government. 
God has instituted the government. We need to be subject to the governing authorities, Paul writes. There's no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So every politician, president, senator, congressperson, uh, ch chief justice, uh, Supreme Court justice, uh, police officer, all right, fire, uh, you know, fire uh, fighters, all of those are instituted by God. Whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. So the Bible does teach we need to respect our authorities. Peter says, submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. We are to obey the law until the law violates God's law. Now, please understand the day in which Paul and Peter are writing these commands to obey the government. I mean, these are a day when, when two-thirds of the population were slaves. And yes, we all believe slavery was wrong, but two-thirds of the population was, were slaves who were hit by really, really high taxes. I mean, you think you paid a lot this year? If we were in the Roman Empire, we'd be paying a whole lot more. And there was great religious persecution where Jews and Christians had really no voice to the government. And there was emperor worship that was going on. And for these reasons, or despite these reasons, we're still told to obey the government until they tell us to do something against the law of God. So civil disobedience, which we're starting to see introduced here in Acts 5.29, understand that that ethically, there are three views of civil disobedience. On one extreme, it's anarchy, where civil disobedience is just the common pattern. I mean, that's the normal mindset for today. Right? Civil disobedience is always right. The other extreme is what's called radical patriotism, where civil disobedience is never right. This was the view of many in the Lutheran church during the Holocaust, where they would support Hitler because they say, oh, well, we, we can't go against the government because of this radical patriotism. And then what I think is the more centrist view is biblical submissionism, where disobedience to government is sometimes right. Francis Schaeffer wrote in his Christian manifesto that if there's ever a case in which a Christian would practice, if there is never a case that a Christian practices civil disobedience, then the state has become the Lord. He writes, either one confesses that God has the final authority, or one confesses that Caesar is Lord. Even the Declaration of Independence states that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and institute a new government. There's a time when biblical laws are, are rebelled against, then we must stand up for it. That's what the Hebrew wives did to prevent the slaughter of the babies during Moses' time when the pharaohs said, kill all these male babies. Or Rahab hiding the spies, Obadiah hiding the prophets from Jezebel, Esther uh, breaking the law that you cannot make a, an, uh, you can't make an appearance before the king without a long set appointment. I mean, it was the laws of the Medes and Persians that she broke when she said, I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Esther was willing to pay that price to save her people. Or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, not worshiping the golden, um, the golden statue. Or Darius, uh, Daniel saying, I'm not going to pray to Darius. Or the tribulation saint standing against the beasts. There's even a biblical theme where those would fight for the life of the unborn, rescue those being led away to death, hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does he not guard your life? No. Does not he who guards your life know it? So there is a time we need to stand against laws that break the laws of God. The sixth reason why the gospel is polarizing is that the gospel may bring persecution. When they heard this, they were enraged and they wanted to kill them. They wanted to kill them. We need to understand that we believers are sheep sent down among ravenous wolves. So we're to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Uh, we're sent out among wolves that want to ravage us. They're described as crafty, strong, 
ruthless and hungry. That's the world that hates the gospel. That's the world that is so polarized against the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ that there's a huge reverse polarity that we're dealing with when it comes to the gospel. This is the, the hatred that brought the early church to a point of, of, of martyrdom where Peter was crucified upside down according to tradition. Andrew hung from an olive tree. Thomas burned alive. Philip crucified. Matthew beheaded. Nathaniel crucified. James thrown from the temple in AD 63. Simon crucified in AD 74. Judas Thaddeus beaten with sticks in AD 72. Matthias stoned on a cross in AD 70. John dying a natural death, but in exile on, in AD 95. And Paul beheaded in AD 69. I mean, the Ro Romans considered Christians atheists. That's why they said they don't worship the emperor, so they're atheists. They're cannibals because they partake of communion. And you know, this is my body, which is broken unto you. They, see, those Christians are cannibals. They're incestuous because they call each other brothers and sisters. And they're rude and arrogant because, you know, they won't worship the emperor. And because they won't worship the emperor, if things go wrong, it's because the Christians didn't worship the emperor. So they're jinxes too. And so for those reasons, Christians went under great, great persecution, particularly in the second and third century, propagated by Nero, who blamed the Christians for, for, for the fire that destroyed Rome. And then they tried to eradicate Christianity in the second and third centuries when martyrdom was greatly increased. The seventh reason why the gospel is polarized is that the gospel messengers are protected while attackers are warned of punishment. And I want the attackers of the gospel to know, you're so warned by the mercy of God. It is mercy to receive a warning. So here's what happens here. There's a Pharisee in the council by the name of Gamaliel. Now, Pharisees were kind of the minority part. The Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees were the rich elites, the liberals. They dominated the ruling party of 70 called the Sanhedrin. So they had, like, like in politics today, they had the conservative liberal element. So the Pharisees were the more conservative element. But within the Pharisees, there was a more liberal conservative, and his name was Gamaliel. Gamaliel is famous for being an instructor of the Apostle Paul when he was Saul learning to be a lawyer. We see that in Acts 22.3. His name means reward of God. He is a grandson of a Hillel doctor. Uh, the Hillel school opposed the Shammai school. Uh, these were the two schools within the Pharisee section of, of these people. But the point is, he was held in honor by all the people. He stood up and then he gave orders to put the man outside for a while. Put the apostles outside. I want to talk to you guys. And he said to the men of Israel, I want you to take care about for what you're about to do with these men. I want you to think about it. Don't be so rash and act impulsively. And then he gives some historical precedents where he says, before these days, there was a fellow by the name of Thutis. Now, Thutis, his real name was Simon. He was a slave of King Herod. But he changed his name to Theodos, which means false teacher. And he proclaimed himself a king, and he led a Roman rebellion, a rebellion against Rome. There was a Roman procurator by the name of Thetis, Roman procurator of Judea. He sent troops to take down Theodos and his followers, killing and imprisoning many. So here he talks about the days of Theodos, who rose up claiming to be somebody. And the number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and, um, and came to nothing. He gives a second example. Around 6 AD, they were taking a census. What happens when you take a census? You also get taxed. right? For how many people are in your family, you get taxed that much. So this is around 6 AD. Jesus is a little baby at this time. And there was a fellow leading an uprising by the name of Judas the Galilean. He rose up in the days of the census, and he drew away some of the people after him, and he perished. And all who followed him were scattered. And so here is this case where, where he's trying to say, so in this present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan 
or that his undertaking is of man, it will fail. Like Theudas and like Judas of Galilee, this is just another movement they're going to fall on their face. But he also says, if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might be found to be opposing God. So think about this from a historical precedence. If it's just a goofy new movement, they're going to fall on their face. If it is of God, then we're going to fall on our face. So Gamaliel is getting him to think about it and give him some words of wisdom. But the point is that God is protecting the gospel messengers as well as punishing those who are going to attack the gospel. That's why the gospel is polarizing. And the eighth reason, the eighth reason that gospel is polarizing is that the gospel is free to receive but costly to share. It's free to receive but costly to share. So they took this advice and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them. So they didn't arrest them, but they gave them a pound of flesh before they left. They beat them and they charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let him go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day is in the temple from house to house. They did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. They didn't stop teaching that Christ is Jesus. In a few minutes, our day camp workers are going to get some training at 11 o'clock that Christ is Jesus. And we're going to be teaching that to the kids. This is the message we're going to continue to propagate in this community. And it is not going to be popular. There's going to be a cost preaching the free gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to understand, though the gospel is free to receive, it is costly to share. They were beat up. And yet they counted it worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. I remember when I was in China and we were teaching pastors out there on the, the areas of uh, preaching and teaching. We attended a, a house church and then I was told that I wasn't prepared, but I was, I was told in 15 minutes, you're going to give the sermon. I'm going to give the what? You know, and, and, uh, and, and I wasn't ready, but, but you know, the, the Lord it used me in that situation, and I was able to share something. And so it was translated into Chinese. They probably corrected everything that I messed up in. But I remember I sat with the pastor afterwards. We were having lunch, and I was looking at his fingers that had been, several of them had been chopped off. And, and he had been in prison uh, for being a pastor. He'd been in prison for his faith. And I told him, I said, wow, you know, we in America, we're, we're praying for you, you pastors in the churches here in China. And he goes, oh, no, no, no. We pray for you in America because we have the privilege of being persecuted for our faith and you don't. Now we get to understand the true church who is being purified because of the persecution and understand that. And as we know the honor of what it means to suffer for Christ's sake, and you don't know that in America. So he said, we pray for you. Oh, man. Our hearts is melted. Will we come to the place one day when we are being repelled because we preach the gospel that we will count it an honor to suffer for the Lord's sake? It's going to happen. It, it'll happen quickly. It'll happen probably in California before it happens in Texas or in Alabama or you know somewhere else in the South. We need to be ready for it. And so like a magnet, understand that the gospel that attracts also repels. Prepare for both realities. Preach the word. No, there's going to be people that are going to hate it. There are going to be people who are going to respond to it. Secondly, the call to proclaim the gospel from God is greater than any man-made law forbidding it. So be ready to pay the price. We may lose tax exemption. We may be put in jail. But we will preach the gospel. Count it worthy to suffer in his honor. You know, when, when, when we think of some of the experiences of, of people who are kicked out of their home for trust in Christ, when we were on a short-term mission trip in Tajikistan, which is mostly Islamic country, that when they had a baptism, they were prepared for that person who was going to public, publicly proclaim their faith, that they would have to live with people in the church because their family will not accept them back in their home after they're baptized, after they've proclaimed their faith publicly. What a great price. 
But the call to proclaim the gospel from God is greater than any man-made law forbidding it. We need to be ready to pay the price. And then also, reflect the love, grace, and mercy of the gospel. May the gospel only be offensive. In other words, let's not be jerks out there. Right? Share the gospel. The gospel itself will be offensive. It's a stumbling block to those who, uh, who want to work for their salvation. It's foolishness to, to those who have a philosophical mortal turn to immortality, Greek way of thinking. Uh, you know, that Paul writes in Corinthians, it's, it's a stumbling block for some, it's foolishness for others. That's what the gospel is. But may it be because divine truth is greater than man's constructed truth or view. May it be because the exclusive, exclusivity of God's absolute truth is greater than the opposing or relative truth. May that be what's offensive. And that the transformation from the gospel is greater than religious works. For those reasons, the gospel is going to be offensive and repelling. May it not be because of our unbiblical character but because of the biblical message that we are going to share. Our precious Heavenly Father, thank you that in our Lord Jesus Christ, we have the gospel, the hope. We thank you that in Jesus Christ, we are commissioned to give a message that is not popular. But Father, may we be brave in our school to give a message where a lot of the students would be jealous that we're committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Where families will be jealous because we love the Lord more than anybody else. And a world that is jealous because there's only one way, one truth, and one life. Only one name under heaven by which we can be saved. And that's the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray. I'm just going to share some uh, announcements at this time. All right. First, um, we're really excited. Day camp is going to be starting. Uh, in June, uh, we're starting our training today. It starts uh, um, in, in our next hour in the room across the hall. And it's not too late to sign up for day camp. So you get a chance to sign up for that. Also, we're excited that today is the first day of our nursery and preschool. And if your kids didn't go to nursery and preschool, your kids were awesome during service. But we also have, uh, we also have this wonderful ministry. We're excited. We do need some help during second service. And it is only during second service. So sorry, we don't have it during first service. Uh, we're, we're building up to that. We're also excited to start the month of June with baptism. And so, uh, so sign up with uh, the pastors uh, to get baptized. On It'll be during the second service of June 5th. Tomorrow is Young at Heart. And uh, we're going to have an awesome lesson by, uh, by Alan uh, tomorrow. So join us live. Or on Zoom, we have a woman's conference um, that, uh, that this summer. Uh, it does cost, but we want to take care of a majority of the cost of that for the ladies that want to participate. So see my wife, Daisy. Oh, honey, wipe your hands. Uh, oh, hand. And then Kayla, uh, who's uh, out of the uh, continent right now. But, uh, but this will lead to a seven-week Bible study in July and August at FBC. We're also doing a, a Ukraine relief fundraiser. Um, I posted some stories on our, our church Facebook about, uh, about how, I, I can't call it up really quick, but 77,000 pounds of food BMW has distributed, including four vans and a trailer to help bring, the, bring everything from Lviv to Kiev. And, uh, and so, uh, it, also, the video of Slavic Gospel Association uh, on how much, uh, uh, how much need there is out there and the churches are doing. And so today's our last day for this fundraiser where we're trying to raise funds that will be dispersed between Biblical Ministries Worldwide, Slavic Gospel Association, Child Evangelism Fellowship that's putting out literature for the children in Ukraine, 
and Word of Life that's doing a lot of housing of uh, refugees in the adjacent countries as well as work inside. We have online giving going on. Uh, we also, you can give checks in, in the back or, or give online. And our missionary of the week is Eric and Christy Mock. And so, uh, you know, he's been traveling to Poland um, quite a bit to help oversee the distribution of the needs to pastors in the Ukraine. And, and so uh, pray continually for, uh, for he and his ministry.